Welcome, ladies. I am so glad that you are here today. Thank you, V, for my introduction. For those of you who may not have heard it very well, my name is Leslie Heisey, and my husband and I have the privilege of being uh, part of the biblical counseling team here at Hope Church, or Hope Bible Church. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> it's hard, that transition from Harvest Bible Chapel to Hope. I'm still struggling. And um, we have the privilege of teaching a course. It's called Heart Resurgence, and it's been running for, I think, six or some, I don't know how many years, a uh, long time, and hundreds of people have gone through it, and we have that privilege. And the, the concepts, the biblical uh, theology and things that I'll be talking about today are from that course. So normally, it's my husband up here speaking, so, so forgive me. But So what we've tried to do, we've tried to take a few little snippets, just a tiny little bit of heart resurgence, and put it into 45 minutes. It's an eight-week class, so you can imagine that this is just a, like a tease, as it were. This is, this is what you're getting today, okay? Okay, this morning. So let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for this very day that you've given us. I thank you for who you are, first of all, Yahweh, the great I am. You are our creator and you are our savior. And we get to call you our father, Abba. Thank you, Lord. Lord, thank you for what you've already done in our lives. You sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us, for our sins, Lord, so that we are no longer slaves to sin. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, I thank you for your promises, your letters that you have written to each and every one of us today, Lord. They are just so intimate, they are so personal, and they are for us, and for that we're thankful. I thank you for each and every lady who is here today. This is an ordained moment, Lord. Nobody is here by mistake. Some have been dragged here by neighbors. Some have been dragged here by mothers, mother-in-laws. Some of you are here and you don't even know how you got here. And for that, Lord, I'm so thankful because to you there's no mistake. There are no coincidences. And Lord, this is your plan and it's all according to your plan. Thank you, Lord. Soften our hearts. Prepare us for what we're about to hear today, Lord, I pray. Teach us what you have for us today, for each and every one of us, because I know, Lord, it's special and it's unique, just as we are. Thank you, Lord, for loving us this way. And it's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you, ladies. Thank you for your patience. You're gorgeous and wonderful and patient. So with technology today, point in case, <laughs> such as internet, reality shows, Instagram, Tweet, Twitter, whatever other those names are that everybody calls it, we become so focused on ourselves, haven't we? We really have. We're told to believe in ourselves. We're told to look out for number, and we're told to put ourselves first. You know it. Well, I stand here to tell you today, contrary to popular belief, <laughs> it really isn't all about you. It really isn't all about me. We are not the authors of our stories, and in fact, we're living in God's story. And that's not our story. If, you, if I was to ask you, okay, tell me your story, you would tell me, well, my name is, and I was born and raised in, and these are my family members, and you'd tell me a few great things from your, from your uh, story, as it were. And that's what we do, right? It's all about me. I'm the main character, and that's what you would tell me all about. But... There are other characters in your story, and I'm sure you'd tell me all about them. And I'm sure if I asked you, hey, where's God in all of that? You would say, oh yeah, he showed up at this moment, and it was just like perfect timing, you should have been there. It was fabulous. You'd tell me, I know you would. I know you would. But that's still backwards thinking, ladies. Because if this is God's story that we're living in, and if this story is all about him and his glory, then you and I are just mere characters in his story. This is radically different thinking, isn't it, than the world thinks. Often we do cast God as a mere extra, don't we, in our story, as if he's in the background and he gets a few honorable mentions here and there. However, he's typically overlooked in our day-to-day -day events, isn't he? Well, I'm here to tell you, God is not, and he will not, be a supporting cast member in his story. He is the creator of his creation, including you and I, and this is his story. Now, I'm not here to say this to frustrate you, to, to, to depress you or anything, but let's put it this way. What would you prefer? You want to be the main character in a play put on by five-year-olds in the backyard, as cute as that is, 
Or would you like to be a walk-on part in the biggest, most epic production that ever was and ever will be? In fact, it's your couple scenes in God's story that gives your life meaning and significance. Do you know the best part? He's the author. He is the author of our story. Our few scenes in our chapters, we know that he loves us personally, individually. His letters are written to us, aren't they? And for us. And he's gone ahead of us. He has sifted every circumstance that you are going through, ladies, ahead of time, before you set foot on this stage. He's gone ahead and prepared it. And in fact, he's planned it. As cruel as that can seem sometimes, right? And he's just not another Photoshop in the back of the book with a little blurb underneath saying who he is. He's not just that, right? He is your sovereign creator. He is our savior. And he is good and we can trust him. And we're going to talk all about that today. Are you seeing this? Good. You might be saying in your mind right now, easy for you to say, Leslie, you don't know what it took for me to get here today. You don't know what's going in my life right now. And you know what? I don't. I really don't. Because we haven't sat down and talked about it. But you know who knows? He knows. He really does know, doesn't he? And I don't understand your current situation. I don't know what takes all of your energy and consumes all of your thoughts. No, I don't know. And these messy circumstances you may or may not find yourself in right now. Half of us don't know here, do we? But God, but the Lord, but God knows, he really knows. In fact, he ordained this very moment for you. You could probably t tell me today, well, of course I know that. I go to church. My pastor tells me all the time. We could all say that. I'm sure we could. But do you live your life in a way that demonstrates that you really do know and trust that he knows everything about you and he's got it in control? So let's begin today. We're going to look at suffering, okay? And the reason we're looking at suffering is not just because the days are evil, because by golly, the days are so evil right now. We know it. But because as God's children, we are promised, promised that we will suffer. So when we look at these verses, in Acts 14, 22, God's word says, through many trials and tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And in John 15, 20, Jesus says, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. And in 1 Peter 4, 12, this is one I encourage you to look at in your word and open it and underlie it and, and commit it to memory. Do not be surprised at the fiery trials when it comes upon you to test you as if something strange were happening, ladies. Suffering is not strange. It is to be expected. Suffering will be something that everyone will experience. There's no exceptions here today, ladies. Every one of us will experience it. Some more than others and some in different ways. But the fact remains, we will suffer. All in unique ways, all passed on through the hands of our Heavenly Father. Yikes, right, sometimes. So what is suffering? There's a definition. To undergo, to, to, to be subjective to, or to endure pain, distress, injury, loss, or anything unpleasant. Simply suffering is anything, anything that hurts or irritates. And I don't think I need to tell you that. You know that. You've been through it. And when simply suffering is anything that hurts or irritates, and, it, and as Christians, it is God's design that suffering causes us to stop and to think, or it should. We've had the privilege of taking heart resurgence to Romania, to the church in Brelia there, and uh, we went to a uh, resort, as it were, and we traveled through the mountains, and it was a beautiful experience, but as we traveled through the winding mountains, if you've been there before, there are potholes, there are bumps, there are you know, old cars that you don't think they're gonna make it up the hill, and then there are Maseratis flying by you couple hundred miles an hour, I'm sure. And then there are um, wagons drawn by a horse with hay totally overtaking 
the, uh, the wagon thinking, oh, that's going to fall off any minute. The driver has to stop and consider every bump along the way. Suffering is the same way. We need to stop and consider. There are going to be bumps in our roads. There's going to be bends. We need to carefully consider. And there's nothing wrong with, as we suffer, to say, why me? Really, God, why now? Or, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? And we should actually consider our suffering in light of those questions. So let's look at our experience of suffering again. Why do we suffer? So first, you can see my experience of suffering, okay? We live in a fallen world. Do I need to tell you that, ladies? I don't think so. Um, there are many dangers in this world. And God saw in Genesis that everything he made was good, right? So meaning, therefore sin is not good, is it? And in Romans 8.22 we read, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And since Adam and Eve, the world is not as it should be. It's all messed up. I suffer and you suffer. And as we suffer to different degrees in different ways in different times of our lives, we experience heartache and pain physically and emotionally. There are natural disasters, staggering loss, injustice, and inhum inhumanity that we see. Chronic pain. There are some ladies who are sitting here today who say, Leslie, hurry up and stop talking so I can stand up. You know, and it's a true thing. Like, they suffer with it every day. Chronic pain. See, we live in a fallen world, and the result of that is sin. The next is sin, our own sin, right? Reaping the consequences of my sin, which is really self-explanatory, ladies. You mock God when you expect good when you've done badly, or when you expect blessing when sowing evil, or when you sow in the flesh. We reap corruption, don't we? I suffer as I reap the consequences of my own sin. And we do struggle with sin on a daily basis, don't we? We give in to temptations, and there are consequences. We know that. Your girlfriend beside you can tell you that easily. No, number three, we're sinned against. And in this case, I'm talking about unjust as an innocent. For example, when a child is abused, dominated by an adult, there is no excuse for that in the world. And for anything of that kind of behavior, it is simply sin, isn't it? And this kind of suffering is unjust, and we may not understand it this side of heaven. Right? And finally, there's Satan, the enemy. Satan in the Bible is called ruler of the world in John 12, 31. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, he's the small g God of this world. He's the prince of power of the air in Ephesians 2, 2. And Satan lies and is the father of lies, John 8, 4, 4. He's a spiritual attacker, the enemy that wants to mess you up. He prowls around like a lying lion waiting to devour you. He's watching you ladies. He knows you personally too. He knows where he can catch you. He blinds our minds, deceives, accuses, keeps us from seeing the light of gospel. He speaks what is false and he hides the truth from us. He deceives us into thinking that God is distant and uncaring. We need to take the enemy seriously, but don't forget. Remember, as Christ followers, we are never alone and we are victorious in Jesus Christ. So take him seriously, but remember whose you are. Promise me. So we suffer because of a fallen world. We suffer because of our sin, for others' sin, and because of Satan. And there's another way of looking at suffering. There are three Ps when we explain suffering. First of all, it's painful. I don't have to tell you that, do I? It's hard. It hurts in many ways, and it's never easy. So don't walk around like, oh, I'm fine. And you're dying inside, right? It's not easy, and we know it. Perplexing. It's mysterious. We can understand some of the theological reasons for it, but when it hits, it's mysterious. That's when you're like, why God, what are you doing? Right? It's out of control. We don't understand. In fact, the Bible devotes an entire book to this subject. The book of Job. Have you heard of it? Yeah, you've heard of it. Job loses all of his possessions. He loses his health and his children. 
his wife, his friends speak harshly of him, and we, see, we get to see behind the scenes the dialogue, don't we? We understand what's going on. But remember, he didn't understand at the time, did he? He just knows he's suffering. And neither Job nor the people around him understood at the time the reasons for the suffering, despite some having their opinions, of course. And we too could mysteriously endure some of the same things and never get answers to why these things are happening this side of heaven. Number three, it's purposeful. In spite of mysteriousness of it, it has meaning, it has purpose. Because God does not waste your suffering. So don't you waste it. Today we're going to consider Joseph's life to see what, that suffering is a tool that God uses to accomplish his, his purposes in our lives. Typically, suffering's not the way we planned it. No, we would never plan these things to happen. And it's never according to our expectations. That's not what was on my list this morning, was it? When you made that list this morning. Never. And Joseph's life is a perfect example. Did you know that Joseph's life, there's more details about it in the book of Genesis than anyone else? And I don't think that means that Joseph's life is more important than anyone else's, but it does mean that there are life-altering truths that God wants to teach us from his life. His life is outlined in Genesis chapters 37 to 50, and at this point, we don't have time to read the entire four chapters, but we'll continue on. But I have highlighted a few details from his life. Joseph is 17 years old. He's just a little babe, really. He's Jacob's 11th son of 12. He was, jo Joseph was his father's favorite. Probably not the best thing. And he gave him a special coat, robe of many colors, which may not have been a good thing either for sibling rivalry, right? Uh, and then to make things worse, Joseph has dreams in which his brothers bow down to him. Yikes. And then a dream about the sun, the moon, and the stars bowing down, his father, his mother, his brothers, which he tells them about. <laughs> Of course. And his brothers res respond, so Joseph, you're trying to tell us that you're going to rule over us? Anyone have siblings here? How well would that have gone over? Anyone have teenagers here? How well does that go over? <laughs> Not very well. And it's the same in his life, right? And soon the opportunity comes. Jacob sends Joseph out to find his brothers who are attending the flock. And in verse 37, 17, so Joseph went out after his brothers at Dothan. They can see him coming in the distance. There he is. He's coming over the hill. And they start talking about him and conspiring, right? Probably talking about all the things that bug them about him. Oh, here comes the dreamer, they would say. And then they come up with, hey, let's kill him and throw him in a pit. And one of the brothers, Reuben, must have had some sort of compassion, said, well, why don't we just throw him in the pit, not kill him? Um, and his plan was to rescue him later. And so that's exactly what they did, if you can imagine. He, he comes up to his brothers, and they take over him, they, they take off all his clothing and throw him into a pit. That's horrific when you think about it. And then they sat down and ate the lunch that he brought them. How cold is that? And that's in 37.22. You can just imagine how scared and confused he was. He was probably hurt. I'm sure the pit was deep when he fell. And he's probably crying out to his brothers, hello, like, did you mean for this to happen? Can you get me out now? It's, this isn't funny, right? And then the brothers see a caravan coming. Hey, bright idea. Let's not just let him die. Let's sell him for money as a slave. So his brothers start to pull him out of the pit. And Joseph's probably thinking to himself, Oh, thank you, Lord. They changed their minds. But no, they didn't. And in fact, they sold them for 20 shekels of silver. In chapter 42, 21, we hear that Joseph pleaded with them, please don't do this. But they didn't care. They wanted him gone. They wanted him out of their life. That is a dysfunctional family. Could you imagine what Joseph is going through as he's being hauled off as a slave? I bet he's saying, why me? Why now? God, what are you doing? What about the dreams I had? Then his brothers kill a goat. They put blood on it. They kill it. No, they kill the goat. They put blood on his coat. And they take it to their father to say, sorry, you got killed by an animal. 
the lies continue. The deception continues. And it doesn't end there. Joseph is sold for a second time to a man in Egypt, and his name is Potiphar. And he's a very prominent man in Egypt. Joseph ends up being a slave, but in a wealthy home. And it doesn't take long for Potiphar to see that Joseph has administrative gifts. And he becomes very successful in his home. He became the overseer of the house, and the Lord blessed the house because of Joseph. And why? Because the Lord was with them. And that's in chapter 39 too. The Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man. However, Potiphar's wife, we've heard about her, she makes numerous advances towards him. And when he rejects her and he tries to flee, he gets falsely accused and thrown into prison. Verse 39, 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. I'm not sure how loving that would feel at the point in time, but it was there. So please remember, ladies, that during his trials, the Bible makes it clear many times the Lord was with them. We hear it in, but God, but the Lord. Whenever you read that, that means it's pointing towards God's character or that he's about to do something. And there are but God and but Lord moments in your lives too. So we see again God's blessing when Joseph receives favor from the prison warden and he ends up basically running the jail. Can you believe that? God gives Joseph the ability to interpret dreams of the cupbearer and the baker of Pharaoh that were in prison with him. And then after two more years in prison, it's the interpretation of those dreams that gives Joseph the opportunity to interpret a dream by Pharaoh that Pharaoh didn't understand and that he had no understanding of. And then in turn, it's this true dream interpretation that gets Joseph out of prison, saves Egypt from famine, makes him second command in Egypt, which gives him the opportunity to save his family and Israel. I would say that's a man who didn't waste his suffering. So we've just gone through a number of points in which the, the life of Joseph, and we see it here in form of a timeline. You've seen timelines before in some of your Bibles, right? We see that his jealous brothers hated him and beat him, left him for dead, Genesis 37, 8. Joseph sold into slavery, we see that. His brothers deceiving. Jacob's father telling him he was dead. They kept that lie going for 20 years. And he was thrown into prison because of false accusations. What if I asked you to do the same about your life? As you think about your own life, what would your lifeline look like? There's homework. You didn't think you could get to a class without homework. Please take out your, your, your uh, lifeline sheets. That's you. You're on this lifeline. And I'm going to ask you, I was going to give you a few minutes, probably not now, but I'm going to ask you to, you know, even right now, if there's like something that's pressing in your mind, write it down. Just a couple words. Yep, that's me right now. Go back in your life. Where was I born? Uh, whom was I born to? Was I born into a Christian family, a non-Christian family? What kind of circumstances have happened to you in the past? We've all got them. We've all got those moments of suffering and of pain. Some of them you understand and some of them we have no idea why the Lord allowed them in our lives. And there will be times in your life when God ordains things to happen contrary to your expectations. And often that's when we make our story about us because we're getting frustrated, we're getting bitter, right? We try to wiggle our way out of that circumstance the best that we can. We do everything we can to control our situation. And if we continue on that path, ladies, we will begin to doubt his word, we lose faith, and we lose sight of him, don't we? You've been there. You call it your dark time. Oh, I went through a dark time, dark period at that time, right? I don't know about you, but I have favorite movies. A couple. My kids cringe every time I do this, but I'll put it on and I will re rewind back to the parts that I love the most. And let me tell you, those parts are like the part when, every, when the good guys win. It's the part when true love rejoices. It's the part when, you know, it's endearing. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel happy. And I'll tell you right now, I never rewind to those parts that are painful. Uh, bad things are happening. I never want to go back to those to relive them. Never. And we do the same thing when we think back in the chapters of our lives. What I'm asking you to do is not something we typically like to do, is it? That's gone. It's, I never want to think about it again, do we? 
But what I want you to do is you're going to write in your timeline things that have happened in your life. You can put the good things in too, please do, because that might give you insight into why some of the more difficult things happened. <gasps> that happened. And if that didn't happen, this could have happened. And that's why that happened. And then it all starts to come to light, right? But what I want you to do when you're doing that is stop and consider using these questions. Why me? Why now? Lord, what are you doing? Or think about it this way. God, what are you trying to accomplish? Can you do that? Promise me you will? I promise you it'll give you a new light into your life. So remember that this is not your story, it's God's story. We may not know the purpose immediately, not on this side of heaven. However, we need to remember that he's sanctifying us and growing us in areas of trust so that he will be glorified. We constantly hear in Joseph's life during all these scenes, the Lord was with him, right? And so many of you are here today and it's been a week, a month, a decade when you've made you the center of your world forgetting that you're in a relationship with the living God and he is at the center of your life. It's about him and his story. So if I could give you one word that describes you about his story, it would be redemption. God is redeeming you and redeeming every situation that you have or will go through. God is not a fortune teller. He doesn't need to predict things because he knows what's coming. He's planned it all. He's gone ahead of you. In Romans 11.36 it says, For from him and through him all things. For, blah, blah, blah. For from him and through him and to him are all things. What does all mean in Greek? All. Thank you very much. It means all. So all things, ladies. All things. All circumstances. In Isaiah 46.10b, My counsel shall stand and accomplish all my purpose. All of his purposes. All of your circumstances accomplish all of his purposes. And once we grasp onto this and in faith, it's when we understand by his providence, he works out his own purposes, no matter the intention of his people, good or bad. Let's look at Genesis 50 and 20. Joseph is now standing in front of his brothers who have bowed down before him. They know the evil they've done against him. They realize his position. He is now the leader of Egypt and he has power to wipe them out if he wishes. But this is what he says. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Joseph, in that moment, his trials are behind him and his brothers are in front of him and the message is, God is in control, not me. And because he is in control, I will leave the outcome to him. Joseph's trials were not punishment. They were a way of preparing Joseph to, fit, to save a family and a nation. And that was Joseph's role in God's story and that was God's work of redemption in Joseph's life for his glory and his glory in our lives, for our good and glory in in our lives, ladies. It's the same. And God's hand in his life is not just unique to him, it's active in our lives as well. And that's why God went into great, such great detail about Joseph's life for you. So before we move on, we have to learn about evil and sin, right? We heard evil a few times there. We need to remember that God is using evil for our good it does not make things, which does not make things less evil, right? Because it's still sin. So Joseph can look at what his brothers did and call it evil, but he also fully understands that he serves a God who's stronger, who is sovereign, and who, who can actually overpower evil for good. And this is what the life and timeline of Joseph is saying to us. God is still working to, to do good in the end. Does that sound familiar? 2,000 years later, God overpowers evil with evil at the cross. It is evil to kill the Son of God, we know that, and by our sin and by the hands of evil men. But God takes that evil and he used it for good, for our salvation. And here we are all here today. So please remember, first and most importantly, that there is forgiveness through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but also the promise of whatever you're dealing with today and whatever tomorrow brings, God is going to work it out for your good and his glory. So let's go to Genesis 50, 22, and 23. 
So Joseph remains in Egypt, and he is in his father's house. He lives 110 years, and he saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, and the children of Machir, the son of Manasseh, who were counted as his own. He has grandchildren at this point in time. His remaining years are blessed. He's 110 years old. And do not forget, God used him to save a nation. In spite of all this happening, God remained at the center of his life in his words. His life was a reminder to tell us that God writes this great story. It's a bestseller, didn't you know? And we need to remember when we enter a season of life that makes no sense, God who orchestrated all that took place in Genesis chapters 37 to 50 is still on the throne today. He is sovereign in Joseph's life and he's sovereign in yours. Your circumstances, your marriage, your unemployment, your suffering, your trials in your relationships, whatever your situation is, as well as the state of this world. So, how involved is God in the details of your life? We need to see his hand in the lives of our past. We need to recognize him going forward. I am promised that he will be there for me. He is in control of every situation that I'm going through, right? And there are no coincidences. There are no coincidences that you're here today. There are no coincidences that will probably go a few minutes late, right? It's all under the sovereign hand of God, and it's orchestrated by him. Believing that he loves me, he loves you, and he sacrificed his son for me and overtook evil as only he can do. So today is a day to take your eyes off yourself and your circumstances. Take a deep breath. And understand our first step is to repent and admit that this life is not all about you, but it's about him. And this story is all about redemption, our salvation, and sanctification. He's growing us, he's changing us, and our glorification someday when we go to be with him. God can and will redeem all of your circumstances and use it for your good, the good of others, to bring salvation to others, and most importantly, bring glory to him. Did you hear that? Glory to him, not to Leslie, not to you. And that can be said with me not even knowing your circumstances today, but because it's in his word. So please take your timeline, and you're going to fill it in more later. You're going to draw a circle around it right now. And around that circle, you're going to write God's sovereignty and providence. His story. He's the author and your redeemer. Can you do that, please? And when we go back to Joseph's timeline, we can see that same circle around his life. There was purpose in his brother's jealousy, their betrayal of him, the 20 years of lies and deception, being a slave to Potiphar, Potiphar's wife's false accusations, Potiphar's unjust judgment of Joseph, and then prison and all parts of his divine plan. He didn't waste his suffering even in prison, did he? And if Joseph's brothers had not sold him into slavery, he would have not ended up in Egypt. If Potiphar had not, brought, had not bought him, he would have not gained the necessary skills to manage people. If he wasn't falsely accused, he would have never ended up in prison and interpreted the dreams. Then the circle of providence can go around the state of the world at that time in slavery, can go around the judicial process in Egypt, timing of Pharaoh's dream, desperation of Pharaoh to listen to a slave, the trust he gave him, the threat of starvation, and the relocation of Israel to Egypt, where they will multiply and eventually become enslaved, all according to God's plan. John Piper does a great job of explaining a bit of this truth and how it brings glory to God, and even those areas where we don't understand at the moment, okay? And I think it's really important for us to watch this video now. I know God does everything for his glory, but does everything that happens glorify God as much as possible? <laughs> That's a very good question. And, and the answer is yes and no, or better, no and yes. So let me give you both no and yes. Um, no sin does not glorify God as much as possible in the narrow lens focus of life. God looks at it, condemns it, is displeased by it, is grieved by it. 
And so right there in that narrow lens, that negative, uh, sinful event that happened or that tragic calamity that happened in and of itself right now with these immediate effects around it is not producing maximum glorification of God. Otherwise, I don't think uh, Paul would have said, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God, if there's no other way to do it. Okay. There's a way to fail at that, right? <laughs> so the, the, the no question, the no answer is uh, no. Not every event that happens brings God as much glory as it could. There's a way to drink to the glory of God and a way to drink to your own glory, and he doesn't get the glory he should there in that narrow lens perspective. But you, you've got to stop at this moment then and, and step back and say, what about taking redemptive history as a whole? What about the whole canvas from eternity to eternity as God has, has ordained it? And I think if the lens is open all the way, and when all is said and done, you look at everything that's ever happened, then even those things that did not glorify God here now in this lens perspective will work out in the big picture so that the big panorama or um, portrait, that's not the right word, what's that, in a, a big picture in a, in a, a, a museum, that will display the glory of God better than any other world could have. Now, I don't know if you can make that distinction with me, but I think it's important that we say, since God loves his glory infinitely, and since God governs the world right down to the roll of the dice, according to Proverbs 16, therefore, he is working in a way that short term he's being dishonored in many ways, but in the big picture, even the dishonoring is going to work for his total glory. So ladies, all sin is suffering will work out in the big picture, right? The big picture. And it will work out in his story, his story of redemption. And that will display the glory of God. Ladies, I have five minutes left. I will finish before, so you can still get back. So thank you. And here's another quote from Charles Spurgeon, and you've got it on your timeline, and I just think it's so important. It would be a very sharp and trying experience to me to think that I have an affliction which God never sent me, that the bitter cup was never filled by his hand, that my trials were never measured out by him, nor sent to me by his arrangement, of their weight and quantity. My greatest comfort, my greatest joy is knowing that his sovereignty has ordained all of my trials because my suffering is purposeful. It has purpose, ladies. Your suffering has purpose. So now we've learned that we're living in his story, right? It's not ours, not all about us. There's purpose in our suffering. And if we take, if we study it, we'll find that he is redeeming us in our circumstances. He is sovereign over all of our circumstances. And he is sanctifying us to make us more and more like his son, Jesus Christ. We, our lives are a mere chapter in the greatest story that ever will be. And we need to trust our author, our mighty, sovereign, loving Father. So what are we going to do with this, ladies? Listen careful. This is a bookmark that we hand out to you in Heart Resurgence. And of course, I don't have time to go through the whole thing. You'll have to come to Heart Resurgence, and I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> but often, when we're looking at our own circumstances, we're, lo we're living in unbelief. That's on the one side, right? Our eyes are away from God, and that spiral spirals us down into despair. Let's flip it over, because I want you to leave in belief right? So in the fruit of belief, what are we going to do? We need to remember who God is, what he has done, what he has promised, and what he commands. So who God is. Oh, you can, you can look through his Bible and you know all those characters. He's a Yahweh. He's the great I am, your creator, your savior, your comforter. You know, right, ladies? 
What he has done, we, we already know what he's done. He has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. We are no longer sins, or no longer, <laughs> sorry, slaves to sin, are we? There is no temptation that he has not given us a way out. And number three, what he has promised. Here's one promise. Here's one verse that I give the ladies that I counsel regularly, and I have it in my phone, in my car, on my fridge, in my washroom, on the mirror, and it's Isaiah 41.10. You can look it up. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So let's explain it quick. I am with you. I am by your side. I am your God. I am over you. I will strengthen you from inside you the Holy Spirit, right? I will help you all around you from where your enemies come from. I will uphold you from underneath. That's one of his promises, and I'm sure there are many promises that you have claimed, and I want you to keep claiming them and keep remembering them minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. Keep your eyes on him. Keep them off yourself and your circumstances. And finally, what he commands, manna, Mercy for today, right? You've all heard this. Lamentations 22, 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The manna is given one day at a time. We're not to store it up, ladies. That's on purpose, right? It goes moldy if we don't, if we do that. And this is the way we must depend on God's mercy. It's on purpose, ladies. We don't, we don't get the strength today for tomorrow. We get the strength for today for today, right? You are giving mercies for today for today's troubles. And let me end with this, ladies. Listen carefully. Her name, you might want to write it down because everybody wants a copy of this after, and I don't have copies, is Venetha Rendell Reisner, R-I-S-N-E-R. She is a regular contributor to John Piper's ministry, Okay. She has a book out too. She's fabulous. Here's her testimony. Countless childhood surgeries. Year-long stints in the hospital. Verbal and physical bullying from classmates. Multiple miscarriages as a young wife. The unexpected death of a child. A debilitating progressive disease. Riveting pain. Betrayal. A husband who leaves me. If it were up to me, I would have written my story differently. Not one of those phrases would be included. Each line represents something hard, gut-wrenching, life-changing. But now in retrospect, I wouldn't erase a single line. Honestly, it is only in hindsight that I can make such a bold statement. Through all of those devastating events, I begged God to deliver me, to save my baby, to reverse my disease, to bring my husband back. Each time God said no. No was not the answer I wanted. I was looking for miraculous answers to prayer, a return to normalcy, relief from the pain. I wanted the kind of grace that would deliver me from my circumstances. God, in his mercy, offered his sustaining grace. At first, I rejected it as insufficient. I wanted deliverance, not sustenance. I wanted the pain to stop, not to be held up through the pain. I was just like the children of Israel who rejoiced at God's delivering grace in the parting of the Red Sea, but complained bitterly at sustaining grace in the provision of manna. With every heartache, I wanted a Red Sea miracle, a miracle that would astonish the world, reward me for my faithfulness, and make my life glorious. I didn't want manna, but God knew better. Each day he continued to put manna before me. At first I grumbled. It seemed like second best. It wasn't the feast I envisioned. It was bland and monotonous. But after a while, I began to taste the manna, embrace it, and savor its sweetness. This manna, this sustaining grace, is what upheld me. It revived me when I was weak. It drove me to my knees. And unlike delivering grace, which once received inadvertently moved me to a greater independence from God. Sustaining grace kept me tethered to him. I needed it every day like manna. It was new every morning. 
God has delivered me and answered some prayers with a resounding yes in jaw-dropping supernatural ways. I look at, back at them with gratitude and awe. Yet after those prayers were answered, I went back to my everyday life, often less dependent on God, but the answers of no or wait, and those answered by imperceptible degrees over time have done a far deeper work in my soul. They have kept me connected to the giver and not his gifts. They have forced me to seek him, and in seeking him, I have discovered the intimacy of his fellowship. In the, in the midst of my deepest pain, in the darkness, God's presence has been unmistakable. Through excruciating struggles, he speaks to me. He comforts me through his word. He whispers to me in the dark as I lay awake on my tear-stained pillow. He sings beautiful songs over me with his love. At first, I want the agony to go away. I don't rejoice in the moment. I don't rejoice at all. But as I cling to God and his promises, he sustains me. Joy is at first elusive. I have glimpses of delight, but it is mostly slow and incremental. Yet over time, I realize I have an inexplicable joy, not in my circumstances, but in the God who so fiercely loves me. Eating the everyday bland, sometimes unwelcome manna produces a joy beyond my wildest imagination. I have found this joy, which is often birthed out of suffering, can never be taken away. It only gets richer over time. My circumstances cannot diminish it. It produces a lasting fruit like endurance, character, hope. It draws me to God in breathtaking ways. It achieves a weight of glory that is beyond all comparison. I still pray earnestly for deliverance for the many things I long to see changed, both in my life and in the world. And that's right, it's biblical. We need to bring our requests to God. But as much as I long for deliverance, for delivering grace, I see the exquisite blessing in sustaining grace. It's not about getting what I want. It's about God giving me what I desperately need, himself. Let's pray, ladies. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you love us. Thank you for your word to us today, Lord. Change us. Help us to understand, Lord, that this is your story, that you have ordained every single moment in our lives, and you are redeeming us and will redeem every situation in our life. Help us to live in belief. We love you, Lord. And it's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you, ladies, for your patience.